Hey folks, welcome to week eight. Can you believe we're here already? We're gonna be talking about the agrarian ideal in this lecture recording for week eight. And it's kind of a bridge between Harper's Changing Works and our discussion of Farmer Boy this week. So let's jump right into it. The agrarian ideal is basically the idea that the American state in terms of its politics, its culture, and even its morality is fundamentally grounded, literally grounded in its basis in agricultural society. The idea that there's this kind of good that comes from America being connected to the soil and to the earth and doing the good work of cultivating the land. And that as long as America remains an agricultural society, will remain stable and good because of that connection. This is an idea that even if you haven't heard this term before, the agrarian ideal is really deeply embedded in the system of values that we have here in the US. And it's especially associated with one particular historical character. Any guesses on who that might be? I'll give you a hint. He's a key character from Alexander Hamilton. He's not Hamilton, but he's another person who has a big role in that particular musical, and maybe we'll play a little clip from that in class so you can get a little dose of how he's portrayed by our friend Lin-Manuel Miranda, but it's, of course, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is a person who essentially put this idea of the agrarian ideal on the map in terms of American history and really fundamentally shaped kind of how we think about the U.S. and who we are, who we aim to be, what our ideals are, what the dangers are for America in terms of the agrarian ideal and how it's contrasted. So just a couple of quick examples that help is illustrate this from some of Jem Jefferson's writing to other figures of the same historical era. We've got a letter from Jefferson to George Washington in 1787, right around the time that the American state is being worked out after the Revolutionary War and the Declaration of Independence and the founding of the Continental Congress and the original basically the start of the American state. He says to Washington, the wealth acquired by speculation and plunder is fugacious in its nature and fills society with the spirit of gambling. The moderate and sure income of husbandry, husbandry in terms of like working with animals, working with the land, begets permanent improvement, quiet life, and orderly conduct, both public and private. Love that word fugacious. Um, I had to look up what it means, but it means fleeting or impermanent, doesn't last. So the idea that uh, there's a contrast here between what people are doing on the land in terms of husbandry is contrasted pretty clearly with people who are doing stuff related to finance, like banking and investment and stuff like that. It's not as pure, it's not as wholesome as working the land. Same deal in this letter from Jefferson to James Madison, same year, 1787. He says, I think our governments will remain virtuous for many centuries as long as they are chiefly agricultural. And this will be as long as there shall be vacant lands in any part of America. When they get piled upon one another in large cities, as in Europe, they'll become corrupt as in Europe. So here you see a very clear contrast between this new American state and the old um, systems of Europe, especially a contrast with agricultural society, the open lands. Um, we'll get to uh, oh, some of the um, things that Jefferson was alluding to there and some of the problematic aspects of that um, in just a bit here. But overall, this idea of kind of crowding in cities, European, that's kind of uh, immoral and a bad contrast to the American state that's emerging that Jefferson thinks should be chiefly, chiefly agricultural. So last quote here, this one to uh, John Jay in 1785, a couple of years earlier, he says, cultivators of the earth are the most valuable citizens. They are the most vigorous, the most independent, the most virtuous, and they are tied to their country and wedded to its liberty and interest by the most lasting bonds. As long, therefore, as they can find employment in this line, I would not convert them into mariners, artisans, or anything else. So there you see it. Uh, people who are working the land, people who are in agriculture, farmers, are the most virtuous and the most valuable citizens. So really putting farmers and farm life up on this huge pedestal and saying that as long as we keep America an agricultural society, we'll be okay. Our politics will be strong, our morality will be firm, and we'll resist some of the temptations that 
Jefferson is contrasting with other places and other um, forms of making a living, of organizing a state that he sees as problematic. Now, of course, there's no de denying the important place of Jefferson in American history, one of the key drafters and thinkers between the uh, Declaration of Independence and our Constitution, just a really critical figure in American history and one of the folks that we really consider our key founding figures. At the same time, a little bit of a hypocrite, slave owner. I think uh, actually in Hamilton, Lin-Manuel Miranda does a really good job of skewering Jefferson on some of those points. And again, we'll listen to a song in class that I think helps illustrate that. But clearly, like, there are some things like the Louisiana Purchase, the idea of manifest destiny, the idea that America was destined to take over the American continent, and that especially white settlers were the ones who would go into those open lands that Jefferson was talking about in his quote to Madison, I think it was. And of course, slavery are all really centrally implicated in this idea of how America will be virtuous as long as we remain agricultural and connected to the land. So without totally trying to trash or demean the idea of the agrarian ideal, you really can't separate it from this idea that white Americans, and especially white elite Americans, had this kind of idea of the virtue of the American state that was connected to farming and the plantation society that the U.S. economy was being built on in this era and continued to be based in through uh, the Civil War period and really through the um, entire 19th century. In a lot of ways, you can say that this is our origin story as a nation. Obviously, not everyone shares in this narrative. Not everyone feels it like it's compelling, but it's a persistent one. It's an idea that we go back to again and again, and we're going to see a lot of examples of this, including, I think, in Farmer Boy, some of the other examples that we'll talk about in class. And you might keep your eyes open for examples where you see the agrarian ideal identified in advertising, in other types of books or readings that you've done, in popular culture, any place where you kind of see it happen. Country music songs are a good place to see it as well. Um, all kinds of examples where the agrarian ideal is held up as the American ideal in a lot of ways. So as I said, the agrarian ideal is still with us. It never really has gone entirely away, and we'll see lots of examples of that. However, it has shifted and changed and been in tension with other ideas and other movements in American history. The one we want to talk about on this slide is the Progressive Era. And to understand the Progressive Era, we have to kind of think about some of the things that changed during the 19th century. So from the time of those quotations we saw by Jefferson in the late 18th century, the start of the American state, a lot of things changed. Remember that graph that I showed you earlier on in the semester that showed the decline in the farming population throughout the last two plus centuries in the U.S.? Well, look at the drop in the curve just during the 19th century from 1790 down to 1900 where you've got about maybe 35 percent of farmers. Already by that time period, we've lost more than half of the farming population in the U.S. So that's a pretty steep decline during that time period. And during that same period of time, we've got this commensurate increase in industrialization. So people moving to urban settings, people working more in factories and other work settings that are non-rural and non-agricultural. So the 19th century really starts to shift what people are doing. And so in terms of what people are doing changing, obviously maybe we start to kind of think differently about who we are and what makes America, America in some ways. And so as I said before, there's this tension that starts to build between the agrarian ideal and some of the um, factors that are put in place, some of the trends, some of the worries that maybe accompany industrialization during the 19th century. Cue the rise of progressivism. Now, progressive is a word that um, liberals have tried to claim in recent years, especially uh, Democrats who are left of the moderate position. They've tried to rebrand the term liberal, which has kind of become a dirty word, especially among conservatives, uh, with the term progressive. And some ways it's related here, in some ways not. So we have to be careful to distinguish it. The progressive movement 
starting in the late 19th century and going into the early 20th century was a distinct movement that really you could kind of consider a little bit more conservative in some ways. And as I explain it, hopefully that will become more clear. Not conservative necessarily with a capital C like Republican, like we think of in our time period now, but conservative in terms of like concerned about change and especially concerned about some of the big changes that are happening to the social and cultural life, the economic systems, of America during the industrial era and all the changes that are happening that we just described before. There's a real focus by the progressives on efficiency planning, especially the use of science and expertise to try to develop new ways to organize society and combat what were seen at that time as some of the social ills that were related to industrialization. People living in urban settings who are often uh, poor, who uh, had difficult living conditions, maybe unsanitary conditions. Um, so there's a lot of concern at this time about health, welfare, and so forth that all sounds really good, but um, at the same time, you could say that it was based in this kind of Victorian morality that was based especially on elite ideals about what was considered a good or a bad way to live. So the elites of the time who were the ones who really um, sh uh, were the leaders of the progressive movement were the ones who kind of decided that things weren't going very really well, that we needed to kind of apply science and expertise to find ways to make life better for people, especially in urban spaces, and to combat some of the ills that came along with uh, the industrialization of America and the rise of the working class in these urban settings. The progressives found allies in the business interests at the time who were really wanted to see the rising working class be more or less pacified. They were concerned about the rise of unions and labor action strikes, which were rampant in the second half of the 19th century, leading into the early 20th century. And so the idea that food could be produced efficiently and cheaply to help kind of pacify and make docile the urban working class was of real interest to business interests at this time. So you could say that uh, progressives had this kind of moral basis for their movement, but at the same time there was kind of a business calculation here happening, especially from the um, factory owners and the other business owners who wanted to have working class people who were well fed in a cheap manner and weren't going to get too riled up about working conditions or living conditions and join unions and strike. So industrialization really becomes the predominant force in American life during this time period. More and more people moving away from the farms and into city spaces. And uh, really, the people who run these industrial operations become key players and really are still today in a lot of ways. And so agriculture during this time period, we don't really get rid of the ag agrarian ideal again but it starts to look a little bit backward. It looks a little bit behind the times in comparison to the modernity of urban spaces, the gleaming new factories, the technology that goes along with producing these new goods that are increasingly available to a growing middle class during the late 19th and early 20th century. And so there's a real concern during this time, including among progressives, that rural life in America and farm life is falling behind, that rural life is in trouble, that people live there are behind, they're backwards, they're uneducated, they're uncouth, they're dirty, they're unhealthy, you name it. We're all concerns during this time period that the progressives have. So again, there's a related concern here that among business interests, Food needs to be cheap so that we can feed the urban working class. Uh, in addition to that, there's the rise of the land-grant university system and increasing application of science and technology through the university system to problems related to agriculture and rural life. And overall, the idea that industrialization worked well, or at least it transformed urban spaces and created all these new industries. So is there a way to apply those lessons and those models to agriculture and to rural life? And this leads to the creation of the Country Life Commission, the Commission on Country Life in 1908 by then President Teddy Roosevelt. He asked this famous Cornell professor, 
Liberty Hyde Bailey to lead the commission and to do a study where they would go around and they would do a survey, they would do interviews all around in rural spaces around the country, find out what the issues were and suggest solutions that would help bring rural America into the 20th century and make it equivalent with urban spaces. So you can see some examples of how people were thinking about this at the time from the introduction to the report from the Country Life Commission that was actually authored by Teddy Roosevelt himself. Here's one example from the introduction that he wrote to that report. He says, if country life is to become what it should be, and what I believe it ultimately will be, one of the most dignified, desirable, and sought after ways of earning a living, the farmer must take advantage not only of the agricultural knowledge which is at his disposal, but of the methods which have raised and continue to raise the standards of living and of intelligence in other callings. So he doesn't exactly say what those other callings are, but what he means are places like industrial settings in urban places where they have the technology, they have the gleaming new facilities, and to allow farmers to take advantage of those and to raise themselves up. There's a lot of language in the report of raising themselves up, raising the countryside, making the, 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 the country citizen equivalent to the urban citizen. Uh, you see a lot of that. So here's one more. Uh, this is actually the conclusion to his introduction uh, in this report, and I won't read the whole thing, but he talks a lot here about civilization and how it rests on uh, life in the country. Does that sound familiar? Again, this agrarian ideal that we really have to be careful about making sure that life in the country is solid, is firm, that there's this foundation for the American state in the countryside, and that if we don't do what's best for them, it's going to make the rest of the country suffer uh, by comparison. So here you see the tension between the agrarian ideal and this emerging sense that country life is behind, it's backwards, it's in need of help, it's in need of uh, some kind of rescue. And this is again where the progressive ideals of efficiency, of planning, of the application of science, technology, and expertise comes in. And the main takeaway from the Country Life Commission is the establishment of the Cooperative Extension System. This is another branch of the land-grant university system that says, okay, we've got these great universities in every state. Now what we need to do is we need to have an extension service that will take this knowledge and bring it into countryside, into particular rural communities that will help those places apply that new knowledge, those new technologies, those new techniques to the problems that face farm communities. So that included scientists who were stationed in different counties all around the country. In fact, if you go to almost any county in the country, including right here in Madison County, you will find a cooperative extension office that's meant to support agriculture in that region. So here in Madison County, uh, just next door to us in Morrisville, there's a cooperative extension office that's connected with Cornell. And that includes folks who help farmers solve problems on their farms, but it also includes things like home economists um, and other folks who do work to help people understand the best ways to raise their kids, to cook their meals, to be um, healthy, to have nutritious food, stuff like that. They were all meant to kind of apply that ideal of progressive knowledge, progressive expertise to country life and raise it up and make it better. So in the 21st century, as we've reached this point where less than 2% of Americans are farmers, we still kind of live with this tension. On the one hand, we want to believe that we're this grounded American society that is based in an agrarian ideal. At the same time, rural life continues to have some of the same problems. We talked about this in class last week about the decline of populations in rural areas, about concerns about what it takes to make a living and whether that's possible in rural spaces. And there's a real concern about rural life and a real despair even that drives our politics today. So that's something that we can kind of continue to talk about and see examples of is this tension between the agrarian ideal and concerns about rural life in the US. So some of you have expressed an interest in getting a little bit deeper dive into some of the topics that we're talking about. So I'm gonna to try to include in my lecture recordings some resources that you might take a look at if you wanna do additional research or reading on any of the topics that we're talking about for a given week. 
in this particular week, you may actually just want to look more closely at the report of the Country Life Commission. It's a really interesting historical document. And you saw from the excerpts that I just showed you that Roosevelt wrote that the language really helps make clear how they're thinking about things at that time and the different ideologies, the different principles and ethics that they're working from. Same thing when you read Liberty Hyde Bailey's main text in the report, you can kind of see like how they are thinking about it and how that's maybe different or the same from how we would think about rural life today. So it's interesting reading. It's not a super long document. You can kind of skim it for maybe parts that you find interesting. I'll put a link to that report in the description for this video. You also might want to look at books that have been written by a historian whose work I really like, David Danbaum. He's written a number of different works that are about the history of this period that we're talking about, especially the progressive era and its impact on rural life. So The Resisted Revolution, World of Hope is about progressivism uh, in this time period. And then Born in the Country is a broader history of rural life in America all really interesting books that give you more depth on that historical perspective that I've talked about today. Finally, uh, there's a link that I'll provide also in the description that gives a little bit more context on the work of Liberty Hyde Bailey, this famous agricultural scientist. There's even a big Bailey Hall that's one of the big lecture rooms on Cornell University's campus. If you've ever been there, you might have seen it. It's kind of a dome shape that's in the middle of campus. It's a really important historical figure, not only for Cornell, but for agriculture and agricultural science in the U.S. If you look at this website, you'll see that there's some documents uh, that they show there related to the Country Life Commission and other work that Bailey did during his career. So finally, some discussion questions that we can talk about in class. First of all, I want to go back to changing works and just as a way of wrapping up our discussion about Harper's work, talk about any critiques that we might make of changing works. Are there things about Harper's argument, any of the cases he uses, the methodologies that he used in his analysis that we could critique? Just the same way we did for Mintz's Sweetness and Power when we finished up that work, we want to do that for Harper as well. Um, are there examples that you can see of the agrarian ideal still in effect today? It might be in terms of politics, might be in terms of ethics or commercials or things like that that you think uh, help exemplify the way the agrarian ideal is still important for the way we think about American life. And especially we can look for examples of that in Farmer Boy. I think we'll see some pretty clear ones that we can talk about, especially in class on Thursday when we have discussion about Farmer Boy in our two sections. So that's it for now. I look forward to talking about these issues with you in class this week. See you soon.